My master teacher, Ms. Ghulam Ahmed, alayhi salam, I said earlier, was the catalyst to Elijah Muhammad teachings and Noble Juad Lee teachings. I want to take those two people. Many benefit from Ms. Ghulam Ahmed, but I ask you this question. Yeah, we're about to get it. Many of us, I'm going to ask you this question. If Elijah Muhammad took this man's Ms. Ghulam Ahmed information, and used it. His name is Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. Now watch these connections. Because I'm even going to show you that it's even possible. It's so much possible that they learn from our teachers that perhaps, perhaps, I got it. Perhaps, put this on me, because they're going to get angry when I say this. It may be, it may, we may find out that perhaps the reason why you don't hear a lot of Noble Jurali teachings, because he was in and out very quite fast, and the reason why you don't hear, um, you can't find Farad Muhammad, right? He just up and disappeared. Maybe, just maybe, and you see for yourself when I show the evidence, perhaps that teacher was Ms. Galam Ahmed himself. <laughs> Hold up. <laughs> Perhaps, after I bring the information, or perhaps it was Mufti Muhammad Sadiq, one of the companions of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. All right? Just maybe. So let's present this information, right? Ooh, I can't wait to get back to him. Let's just present this information of Islam in America. So let's go to Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. Just a little bit of information about Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. Mufti Muhammad Sadiq was a direct companion of the Promised Messiah, um, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. He learned from him, studied from him, and he was a young guy towards the end um, of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's life, alayhi salam, which Mirza Ghulam Ahmed uh, met his demise in 1908. But nevertheless, uh, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq arrived in America in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on February 15, 1920. Let's pay attention to the dates and what's happening here. He came in on the ship, the SS Haverford. You can um, do some research on that. Um, then he moved out to Ohio, and then he moved out to where? Good old Detroit. Now let's pay attention. This is 1920, right? Good old Detroit, Michigan. Right. So he set up shop in Detroit, Michigan. He went to teach the people there. And while he was teaching the people there, the, you know, the black people was responding to him. And, you know, um, he was the, one of the first ones because they didn't have English literature of the Quran, of the um, books of the prophets. So the Ahmadiyya, this is fact. So the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, their missionaries, they translated so much information that you ain't have no choice if you was an English speaker but to read their translations. You understand? Because they was the first to do it. So he went to Detroit. He's teaching out there. Then he set up a masjid out there, which became the headquarters. It got, it got a little ugly out there due to politics and things like that. And guess where he goes next? He goes to Chicago. 
He goes to Chicago. Does this story sound familiar? And he goes to Chicago and he sets up a headquarters, um, uh, uh, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mosque, the first one in Detroit and the first one in Chicago. And this is between two years from 1920 to 1922. At this point, you have allegedly Mo Noble Drew Ali on the scene, not allegedly, he was on the scene at this time, but he never came out with a Circle 7 Quran. Let's pay attention to this until what year? 1926 or 1927, whatever one they want to put, right? So we know that this distribution of Islamic material that came in English came from um, this man here, which was the catalyst, um, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. Now, Let's go. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Now, I got to go to the internet for this. And I did that on purpose because I want y'all to know. Now, look. So, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. Um, remember, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, alayhi salam, teacher, talking about this great Dajjal who's the father of all Satan. And our terminology, the devil. Right? The white man's the devil. He said that the, they are the father of all Satan. Right now, he also told us that Jesus ain't coming back in the sky before our beloved um, uh, messenger, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, came on the scene. Before he started teaching, but the right? Say he is back from the sky. Hold up, uh, you know he ain't coming back from the sky. They could keep waiting, keep waiting, and they they'll lose all their generations. But your generation going to come to Brother Bashir. Because we teach that Jesus didn't die on the cross and he ain't in the sky and he ain't coming back for you. And the Dajjal is not no monster, but rather it's amongst the white man. But look, but so this story, let's go. So you don't think, this is nationofislam.org. See it up here? NOI.org. So I'm not, I'm, not making, um, I'm not making this stuff up. So let's give just a brief um, review of Elijah Muhammad, right? So Elijah Muhammad, he says that, um, let's go down here. And then, and then on July 4th. 1930. So now we're dealing with 1930, right? So um, the Ahmadiyya squad is on the scene, 1920s. We on the scene, right? So on July 4th, 1930, the long-awaited savior, the black man and woman, Master W. Farad Muhammad, Far, excuse me, Farad Muhammad, um, appeared in this city. He announced and preached that God is one, and it is time for blacks to do for themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And then it says how Elijah Poole White first learned of the Temple of Islam, wanted to go visit it. And, you know, he basically was like, nah, I'm going to go see it first, right? So he, it, it, the story goes that in 1931, after hearing his first lecture at the Temple of Islam, Elijah uh, Poole, which was Elijah Muhammad's former name, um, um, Elijah Poole was overwhelmed by the message, immediately got accepted. Then Elijah Poole invited and convinced his whole family to accept Islam. The founder of the Nation of Islam, he said, gave him the name Kareem, right? And made him a minister. And later he was promoted to the position of Supreme Minister and his name was changed to Muhammad. The name Poole was never my name, he said. He said, that's the name of the uh, slave masters, etc. right? So don't put that on him. So then it says that Mr. Muhammad be quickly became an integral part of the Temple of Islam for the next three and one half years. Now that's 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 before we do that, put the camera over here and let me let me let me show you something. Mr. Muhammad Sadiq came before W. Far Muhammad. Can we can we agree to that, Sanella? Yes. Yes, right? Okay. How much how long did W uh Far Muhammad stay with the minister and in our in our midst three and one half years is this correct, correct. guess how long mufti Muhammad muhammad sadiq who we have the documentation on the ss haverford how he came in was arrested so they got those documentations in the detention center guess how long he was here in the united states of america Three and a half years. So from 1920 to 19 to September 1923. Uh, right? So that, let's keep watching though. Watch. Because this is why our teacher is important and black people could definitely benefit from his teaching. The, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did. No, but Ali did. I ain't finished yet. We want to show you. Just watch. And Mr. Muhammad was taught personally by his teacher, right?
and the Muslim community, it goes on, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we know the history because I don't got to play on that. We know the history. We know Elijah Muhammad went up. He went up to Detroit, right? Where, where, where we at? Let's keep going. Oh, wait. Um, before that, this is very important. Um, he's living here. His teacher, Master W. Farah Muhammad, was also harassed by the police and forced out of Detroit and moved to Chicago where he continued to face imprisonment and harassment by the police. So it's mighty funny that the early Ahmadi missionaries that come on the scene talking about this Dajjal and the Dajjal is the white man and Jesus ain't down on the cross and that's spookism if you think that, say that that this is spooky, but then you find that the Ahmadis was there um, before uh, Muhammad yes, so check this out then they say Mr. Muhammad avoided uh, where is that? right here, yeah all right, so he moved from Detroit to Chicago where he continued, blah, blah, blah. In 1934, Master W. Farad Muhammad departed the scene and left. And they just say departed the scene on their site. Departed the scene. But you know who departed the scene? Mufti Muhammad Sadiq departed the scene for sure. And But he left on a ship. And they know, we know where he went after that. He went to Europe to go teach out there. But nevertheless, go on. By 1935, this is very important, Ms. Muhammad faced many new challenges. His teacher had instructed him to go to Washington, D.C. to visit the Library of Congress, Congress in order to research 104 books. 104 books on what? On the religion of Islam. Now, who gave him the knowledge of there's 104 books on the religion of Islam? His teacher, right? Now, if this is 104 books that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad can read, then that means they had to be in what? In English, right? So that means that the teacher had to be the one that actually taught him where these books are, where they're located, and how you get them, right? Boom. But check this out. Um, the study of religion is Islam and uh, among other subjects. Also, 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 after assuming the leadership, leadership of the Temple of Islam by the order of the founder of the nation of Islam, Mr. Muhammad faced death threats. Um, it goes on, right? But look, let's go here. They say he said he, 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 he had death threats, right? So he used many names. But he was also known under many names. Mr. Evans, his wife made a name. And Ghulam Bogans. Whoa. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. And he has a name of Ghulam as an alias. When the teachers and the students of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed came to America teaching this and they knew of his name because when they, when they seen Mufti Muhammad Sadiq, they said, who is that dark man in a green that always wear this green turban? Right? So let's go. Queen. This is what we want to do. We're going to watch this video of um, W.D. Muhammad, right? Which was Elijah Muhammad's son, his great son. He actually took over the nation, um, the power of the nation after his father met his demise or, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay, so what we're about to see is W.D. tell the world that his father, library, that he studied in, those books that he had in there were from the Pakistani Ahmadi Muslim sect. This is what he's about to break down to us, and he's about to name some books, he's about to name some literature, but we ain't dumb yet. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the promised Messiah and Mahdi, and you know this terminology as well, as Mahdi. Elijah Muhammad grew up on a farm, sharecropper. He ain't one talking no Mahdi. Somebody taught him Mahdi. Somebody talked to him Masi or Messiah. Somebody taught him Islam. Mr. Ghulam Ahmed, Leia Salam, and his companions taught our brothers and sisters. We done cracked it through the teachers of Mr. But that. But come on, that's that's work it out. Whoa! Why you ain't come with this fire, man? What the hell wrong with you? And then when that when that started, I mean. Uh, were you on your, I mean, because there were certain teachings being taught, and I think maybe you had to, to, to seek knowledge from other sources in order to really... Oh, certainly, certainly, but I didn't have to go far. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm about uh, 19, maybe, 
17, 18, 19. Yes. And I'm living in a nice house now. We, we're living in uh, Potmouth, living in Sachs, but mm -hmm. now we got a nice house on Woodlawn near U University of Chicago, right. you know, in that kind of environment. And um, uh, my father, ha uh, where we slept, my, my brother and I, um, if, as soon as we open our door, there's a library, glass doors. Mm -hmm. And that's my father's private library. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't locked. You could go in. Mm -hmm. So he had Islamic books. Mm -hmm. He had books on the life of the prophet, prayers and peace be on him, and other Islamic books by by mostly by Pak Pakistani yes. authors. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, an Ahmadiyya. Yeah, Ahmadi yeah. movement uh, yeah. publications, yeah. Uh, which is not accepted in Saudi Arabia, as you know, right, you know. Right. Um, um, and uh, one day, I just decided to take a book and read it. Mm -hmm. So I read uh, uh, from his books, from my father's private library. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And so, as you read from those books and you started to increasing in knowledge, I mean, how, how did you feel? I mean, amongst the people who really hadn't. Uh, discovered or learned okay. about the things which you knew. Well, at that point, during that time, when mm -hmm. I was reading my father's books, uh, what I read was uh, Iqbal, you know, Dr. Iqbal, Dr. Mm -hmm. Iqbal, um, on the man, uh, God, man in the universe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I read uh, some other books by Ahmadiyya, and uh, believe it or not, <clears throat> they, I wasn't consciously aware of any of those materials affecting my loyalty at all mm -hmm. to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, mm -hmm. the leader of the Nation of Islam, right. you know, my father. Right. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see those things threatening that relationship. And I guess by him having them as his private books, mm -hmm. uh, that made it easy too for me to read what he was reading mm -hmm. and not feel that it was threatening uh, anything. Um, there we go. So you could clearly hear, you could clearly hear him say that in that library, these books of his uh, father, they were Pakistani books, right, of the Ahmadi Muslim community. This is, his, this is exactly what he said. All right. So now, let's go here real quick because we're going to finish with Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. Now, what I'm saying, don't get me misconstrued. I'm just showing you the information. But what I'm saying is, is that somebody is, was hiding Blatantly or indirectly, the influence of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, perhaps it's because he claimed to be a messenger and a prophet of Allah, so they wanted to use the information without taking this Messiah and Mahdi title, and maybe somebody used it for themselves, which is exactly what's happened. But look, so let's just go here real quick to the Nation of Islam, their website, the Final Call store real quick. Let's go there real quick, all right? Now this gonna be it's gonna be very very interesting, very very interesting. Now my point is is that if Elijah Muhammad himself understood the significance of the teachings of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Layy Salam and what he had to offer to the world, and he accepted a lot of his teachings, in particular. You see where the white man's the devil came from. You can see where the white man's the devil came from. Not that it wasn't in Elijah Muhammad's soul or spirit, because we knew something was wrong with this cracker when he was on the plantation, how he was treating us, but to come out with the ideological perspective mm, from an Islamic standpoint, because all of the other ulama Muslims talking about the devil is a mysterious creature. You understand? That's look. So you go up here to um, the Nation of Islam store. Let's go through their books. Let's see. The New World Order. What they got up there for sale? Mulana Muhammad Ali. Do you know that's um, one of the students of uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, right? What do they got over there for the uh, Muhammad, the Prophet book? Mulana Muhammad Ali, right? What is over there in the Muslim daily prayer book? And why they're not using 
other references because they know that the teachings of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed alayhi salam was sublime, divine, and right on time. And he taught that the damn white man is the father of Satan. And he taught us that Jesus ain't died on the damn cross. And then Elijah Muhammad and them used the teachings to go back and teach our black people the same teachings. But all I'm saying is, is throw my teacher, my master teacher, some more love and let him know that his teachings definitely helping to change. The world. In 1914, a progressive Muslim movement began to sweep across the Lahore province of British India. They called themselves the Lahore Ahmadiyya Movement. Led by Mahulana Muhammad Ali, they set themselves on a path to propagate Islam throughout the world. The group began a publishing company that produced vast amounts of Islamic literature in various languages, including English. In 1917, Muhammad Ali translated and published the Quran with a commentary in both English and Urdu. He became recognized internationally by Muslims and non-Muslims as an authority on Islam. Ali also organized worldwide missionary activities and in 1920 sent his first Muslim missionary to America. His name was Dr. Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. As a representative of the Ahmadiyya movement, his mission was converting Americans to the religion of Islam. He arrived in America in 1920 and started a monthly magazine called The Muslim Sunrise, which contained articles on Islam and attracted a substantial number of converts. A few years later, another missionary came to America from India. His name was W.D. Farrard. Farrard brought Ahmadiyya publications, including the Muhammad Ali Quran, directly to the inner cities of America. There, he was introduced to a man named Elijah Poole, who would later become known as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Master Farrard Muhammad gave him 104 books to study. And Elijah Muhammad said to me, the best of those books was the Holy Quran. And the other 103 all contained aspects of the life of Prophet Muhammad. God says there, uh, uh, religion, I have completed my favor upon you and choose for you. Islam as a religion. Elijah Muhammad put Islam squarely into the public limelight for the first time in North America and began the process of non-Muslims understanding the Quran. Between 1880 and 1930, the Ahmadiyya pioneered Islamic missionary work in Europe and America. In America, and I want to emphasize this because I know the Ahmadiyya get a bad rep among Muslims today, um, all Islamic and proto-Islamic development before 1930 was linked to the Ahmadiyya movement. And this is true for the first half of the 20th century, even though you have Muslims who were there and who would filter in, but any institutional or organized effort to convert Americans and to bring Islam to Americans is again coming from this group. And this also is true of uh, Muhammad Alexander Webb, who was known as the first white American convert or one of the first white American converts to Islam. He spent about three to four years writing back and forth to Ghulam Ahmed before he even converted to Islam. So I don't think we can overemphasize um, the role that the Ahmadiyya played in this enough. Uh, this, um, this presentation does emphasize the role of the Ahmadiyya because it's a role that is really, let's be truthful, ignored among Muslims you know, at large. And um, that's a role that I want to highlight because the purpose of my dissertation was to understand the intellectual background out of which um, fraud came from. And it was not, 
I was less interested in looking at a personal biography, a personal history, and more interested in understanding the intellectual, the religious, the, the philosophical, and you know, um, the ideological background behind the Nation of Islam, because I feel that it's been me misinterpreted too often in, in history by scholars, whether they're historians, sociologists, many got certain aspects of it, but no one really to my understanding, seemed to, to really understand what it was that the Nation of Islam was about and what fraud was attempting to do. But then to go on to some of your more, I guess, um, um, I, maybe emotive concerns, uh, I don't think that we're taking anything away from African American agency. There is a chapter in my dissertation, or at least a part of a chapter, I just can't remember, um, that looks just at um, the platform that the Ahmadiyya used. And if you read the entire thing, or forget reading whatever I wrote, that's not that important, but if you look at the, the whole, the entire history, you understand that the Ahmadiyya are only agents and actors themselves. They're attempting, they're, and that's why I spent so much try, time trying to build up what they were doing before 1930. They're attempting desperately to find a, someone who is receptive to um, What's the word I can use to um, uh, um, um, liberating Islam itself? Even though they're critiquing Christianity, this is in British India. You know that this group uh, uh, arises, and they don't feel that they can. Uh, um, uh, uh, they don't feel that they can. Um, they feel that Islam, that, 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 the, that Muslim societies themselves have become corrupt. And of course, all Muslims are now at this time saying, "What did we do wrong?" You know, shaking their head because you know we're coming under the yoke of these these infidels, so to speak. You know, or at least that's their language. So you have some going into the camp of like, "Okay, we just have to go back to the Hadith and the Quran, and we've just messed up." Others saying, "We just have to blindly imitate the Christians because they've made progress and they have science and and rational thought on their side." And then you have this one lone little guy, Ghulam Ahmed, saying, "You know, well, no, Islam has what we need, and we don't need to imitate." blindly and we don't need to um, imitate without thought go even our predecessors we need to you know use our, our brains and think and, and look at what we have in the Quran and um, it's not to say that I agree with everything that Ghulam Ahmed said but the one thing that he was attempting to say was look you know our ulama has betrayed us they are basically working hand in glove with the rulers and the, the social and, and political and economic leaders of Muslim Muslim societies and so they've betrayed the trust of the Ummah. So you've got this scholarly class who is no longer doing what it needs to do. Let's go and look at the West then. They are, they are actually, by their behavior and their, their out, um, their, what they're producing, they are actually more in line and more in sync with the message that Allah sent to the world um, through, revealed through, through Muhammad. And look at even the democratic society as an example. And they were, they were not just um, theorizing about this. They're actually studying the history. They're studying the scriptures. These men were extremely learned in, in the languages that, that scriptures were revealed in, you understand? And they were religious scholars. They were scholars of scripture. They were historians. They were mathematicians. They were, um, uh, and they were putting a lot into this. Now, when they get to America, they're attempting to do the same thing that they did in Europe. They only want to appeal to the people who have the power to actually engineer society. They're not concerned so much with the, um, the unlettered masses. And so that's why their first their target population was not even African Americans. So it's kind of like the, the, our agency is still there, you understand? What they do is when they, when they begin to hit these brick walls because of racism, and then they also notice simultaneously that the few converts they are making are African Americans. They begin to study that culture, the culture of. So, I mean, they're aware of the contemporaries. They know Father Divine. They know what's going on. But they're also aware of and quoting Blyden, like you mentioned, and um, Bishop Turner. And it's Reconstruction, right, after the um, Civil War. They are actually studying the Ahmadiyya. So they're, they're looking at what we've done. They're studying our religious leaders and our social leaders who have gone into the Deep South or been born in the Deep South and who are late, basically coming in on that, you know, 
Booker T. Washington approach, or not even just Washington, that approach where you're saying, look, we need some kind of paramilitary outfit for our men, we need discipline, we need this. And so they're studying that. And it is only by studying what we have already done, as well as, as our experience, that they are even able to blend something that would appeal to us. So they have definitely built their platform. Um, actually, they're bringing what they have to a platform that we've already built. I look at his whole, the things that he's, his movement is really critiqued for the most. To me, when you really look at him and study him and his, what he's saying, to me that seemed to be more a, a, um, a means because you have the ulama saying, okay, that's it, you know, like unless you come through one of our schools and, you know, study for 40 years and then when you're ready to die, you know, we can stamp our seal of approval on you. Unless you do that, you're really not fit to think and, and interpret or make this religion relevant to you. And so he was actually saying, well, you know, I don't need to be stamped with Ham, ha, uh, Hanafi or Shafi'i or any of these because I'm actually inspired on my own. God's speaking to me, you know? So that's kind of his way of circumventing the obstacles that are, are there at that time. Of course, with any movement, once the popular leader dies, you have these struggles for power and, 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 and eagles and, and comp, uh, conflicting agendas. And so his um, one of his sons, who becomes the head of of the Ahmadi movement proper that um, is the larger movement and the more visible movement and is referred to by outsiders as the Qadiani, that group in order to retain its, um, they wrestle control of the movement away from his closest um, supporters, which would be the, the Lahore intelligentsia that I mentioned, um, Muhammad Ali, Shir Ali, um, Shir Khan, these guys. And what they say is, um, what they do is he, he makes it, there's more of a personality um, cult type uh, um, involved in it. So he's saying, you know, my father was the Messiah and I'm his son, you know? And so they emphasize, as I tried to say earlier, the particularistic aspects of Ahmed's thinking. But I don't think that was all to it, and I don't even think that was the most important part. To me, and again, this is going in and reading and looking at what's being said and, and, and written, the important part was that effort to reclaim Islam from the chokehold, if you will, of Sunni orthodoxy. And that was not about uh, proliferating more Ahmadiyya. That was about liberating Islam. And I do see Imam Muhammad as kind of a, a logical culmination to those efforts and a fulfillment of it in a sense. No matter how far Couldn't be much more from the heart Wherever just in we are And nothing else matters Never opened myself this way Have his eyes really